it's so nice to be here with you, and, uh, and I've already enjoyed uh, your campus and the gracious hospitality uh, that's been offered here, and it's uh, my pleasure to be here. Uh, lots of times when I speak to a student group, I like to kind of be upbeat and use some humor, uh, but I chose this morning to speak on the book of Job, and um, <laughs> so there, that's the only joke of the morning. <laughs> and, uh, no, so, uh, so it is a, a more um, uh, somber topic, and it'll have that tone to it, uh, but that won't pervade all of my talks today. But it's an important book, and I think it um, it calls for our attention. So that's what I'd like to speak about today. Millions upon millions of mankind burned, crushed, bruised, mutilated, slaughtered. For what? For thinking. For walking around this world with the wrong shaped eyelids, wrong shaped noses. For sleeping the wrong city, the wrong night. London, Dresden, Hiroshima. Ah, Hiroshima. Never could so many have suffered more for less. This is a segment of uh, Archibald McLeish's Pulitzer Prize winning play, JB, based on the book of Job. McLeish was an existentialist. And as a result, he was very familiar with the problem that the book of Job poses. But he had no answers. And he found no answers in the book of Job. He could only pose again the problem of the book of Job. The suffering that we see all around us. The suffering that we and our loved ones experience. <coughs> it's not surprising that he couldn't find answers because I suspect that um, he was looking for the wrong ones in the book. See, the book of Job is not intended to give an explanation for suffering. The book of Job is not intended to tell you why you suffer or why a loved one suffers. The book is not there to tell us why Job suffered. So the book is not out to give the answers that we would very dearly love to have. And we open the book sometimes hoping to find those answers. And inevitably come up short. I think that means that we are looking for the wrong answers. And we need to reevaluate what it is that the book of Job is doing. Many of us perhaps have had reason in our life to be discontent with God, dissatisfied with how he's running things. And we sort of wish, perhaps, in an unguarded, non-theological moment, to wish that someone would call him to account. And get some straight answers for once. We wish, perhaps, that we could audit God. Actually, that's exactly what's happening in the book of Job. Because the book is not about Job. It's interesting, from the very opening pages, Job is vindicated. He's a good guy. He's got it all together. No problems in, in his relationship with God. No shortcomings in his performance his practice, his faithfulness. And everybody, 
Everybody acknowledges that through the book. Even the friends who keep hunting and hunting and hunting for something wrong with this guy really can do nothing but speculation because they know of nothing. So really, Job's character is not in question. Job has trials, but Job is not on trial. It's not a book about Job. It's certainly not a book about counseling techniques. <laughs> uh, okay, and we're not really supposed to look through it saying, oh, should I do that, should I do that, should I not do that? It's not a book about you or your suffering or the suffering of a loved one. It's not about why good people suffer. This is a book about God and how to think about God in a world gone awry in our experiences. It's not going to give us answers about suffering. It's going to tell us how to think about God when we're experiencing suffering. And at the heart of it all is a, a lingering question. In even the worst of times in our lives, can we affirm that God's ways are the best ways? Now, for that, we have to think about God's ways. What do we know about God's ways? What can we say about them? In the Old Testament, um, the sort of philosophy of the day is called the retribution principle. The retribution principle is that the righteous will prosper, the wicked will suffer. It's not a philosophy unique to the Old Testament. We find it all over the place today, both in our churches and in the society around us, this sort of expectation that good behavior will have its rewards from above. And so the retribution principle frames the expectations and the book of Job is framed with those expectations. Now, in the retribution principle, you would have a just God, and you've got an innocent, righteous man, Job, and with the retribution principle, everything should be nice and tight, Job prospering as he was at the start, God delighting in Job's prosperity and his righteousness, and the retribution principle just clicking along beautifully. But of course, then things fall apart. And in the book, they have to decide which of those three parts has to be dropped here. You can't hold on to Job's righteousness, God's justice, and the retribution principle all at once in the circumstances that unfold. Which parts you're going to give up? Job's friends hold on to the retribution principle. They are not ready to question the justice of God, and therefore, Job, sorry, man, you drew the short straw. This is where we have the doubts. It's about your righteousness, supposed, so-called. Job, of course, one thing he knows, he hasn't done anything to deserve this. He can't see his way past the retribution principle, and so he lifts his eyes to the skies and says, there's the problem. God, hate to say it. Ali, who comes along, the champion of God's justice, and he has his own little tricks to play to make things work out. But everybody's working with this, this triangle, I call it, the triangle of, of claims. God's justice, Job's righteousness, the retribution principle. What you going to give up? Another element that was popular in the ancient world uh, is what I call the great symbiosis. The great symbiosis reflects how the rest of the world thought Israel was not supposed to think this way. But in the great symbiosis, the gods had created people as slave labor. The gods had needs. They needed food. They needed housing. They needed clothing. You know, just like any graduate student, college student, they, they had needs. And so, but they got tired of doing those for themselves. So they said, we can create slave labor create people, they will meet our needs. We'll take care of them, they'll take care of us. That's the symbiosis part. So this great symbiosis that explained everyone's roles here. P 
People have been created to meet the needs of the gods. They met the needs of the gods. In turn, the gods protected them and provided for them a nice little tight circle of codependency. Now, of course, Israel was not supposed to think that way. So they didn't always escape that, but they weren't supposed to think that way. But that's another aspect that kind of dominates the ancient world. You can see then that if the gods, in this case God, was not taking care of Job, you know, the, the whole thing was breaking up. So those are some of the ways that people were thinking. For that reason, because of the retribution principle and because of the great symbiosis, there was this pervasive situation in the ancient world where people were carrying out the religious duties as sort of a, as sort of mercenaries. After all, they're doing what they need to do so they can get what they want to get. Kind of like when you have a job that you don't like, you know. Um, so you work crummy hours and, and low pay, and, and, but you know, you've, you've got to do it to get what you want to get. Okay, so this idea of doing so that you can get the benefits. Now that's exactly the situation that gets targeted in the book of Job. The challenger comes before God. Now I've called him the challenger, you noticed. In the book he's referred to as the Satan. Satan is a Hebrew word and it refers to, to an individual who is serving an adversarial role. Sometimes it's antagonistically adversarial, other times it's more appropriately adversarial in a system that requires an adversarial role. Um, it can be a prosecuting attorney in a court case, um, anything of that sort. So uh, someone who takes an, an opponent sort of role. And that's, that's how this challenger comes. He comes before God as a challenger. Uh, we should be reluctant, just as a side note, to bring all of the profile of Satan in from the New Testament. Old Testament doesn't yet have that kind of developed understanding, and here it is not given as a personal name, but it's given as a title, as a function, a role that he's playing. So I chose something somewhat neutral. His challenge to God is a legitimate challenge. We shouldn't picture it being uttered with a diabolical chuckle. You know, boy, I'm going to get that Job guy. <laughs> I've got a plan. I can do it. You know, we shouldn't read too much of that into it. God treats this seriously as a serious challenge. And it's this challenger who is coming in to audit God. He is posing a question to hold God to account. A rather presumptuous task. Some might even say, though, that perhaps this was the assignment that he had. This is what he was supposed to do. He's doing his job, just doing my job, don't get on my back. Okay? So he comes in with a very appropriate question. And that question is, does Job serve God for nothing? See, that's the question in the whole ancient world. Because, no, they were not serving God for nothing. They were serving God for benefits. They had blessing and provision and protection to gain. And that's worth a price. So when God says, have you seen my servant Job and his righteousness? The challenger raises the appropriate question. Is it really righteousness? Or is it just protecting his own back, doing what he's got to do to get the benefits? Are you sure it's really righteousness? Is it disinterested righteousness? That's the question. It's not a question whether it's righteousness. What's his motivation for it? Is it disinterested righteousness? Now, in this we find a implicit challenge to God's policies. See, if it's God's policy to bless righteous people, he's training them. You know, Pavlov's dogs, you know, <laughs> you set up the routine, set up the pattern, uh, immediate responses kind of thing. He's training them. By blessing righteous people, he's encouraging them to desire what he's giving them. 
And if that's so, then is anybody really righteous just because it's the right thing to do? Just because God is God? Just because that's appropriate? How would you know if you're rewarding them all the time? You've created mercenaries. The challenger then is not only challenging Job's motives, he is challenging God's policies. This is no way to run a world. You're actually subverting righteousness by paying them off. That's the setup of the book. God's policies are on trial, not Job. Once his motives are shown, that will only serve to then give an answer about God's policies. And so God agrees, because after all, the only way you can tell if he's doing it not for benefits is to take away the benefits. Now, this creates a complex situation in the book. Job believes that he's on trial, and his friends do too. Job considers himself to be the defendant in a criminal trial. He tries to shift that. He tries to make himself a plaintiff in a civil case because he keeps trying to call God into court for treating him wrongly. So he's trying to shift his position from defendant to plaintiff. See it? In actuality, of course, it's neither. In actuality, he is the star witness for the defense. God's defense. And this shows us again that it's really God and God's policies that are up for discussion in the book. And really, isn't that what we want to know about? We want to know what in the world is God doing when we're having difficulties. Uh, just looked at my watch. Okay. Uh, not only do we have the challenger's challenge about God's policies, the minute Job starts suffering, we get another challenge. Job's challenge is, um, I'm the good guy. How come this is all happening to me? So you see, the challenger's saying, it's not a good idea, God, for righteous people to prosper. You're subverting their righteousness. Job says, it's not a good idea, God, for righteous people to suffer. Okay, because we're the good guys. Okay, what's a God to do? Uh, You know, neither way is correct. And so the book's going to help us work through it. How could God lose? God could lose if, um, if Job, first of all, if he takes his wife's advice, curse God and die. Then Job would be saying, you're right, I don't really care about righteousness. I only care about stuff. I want the goods. God could lose if Job listens to the friends. The friends want him to just confess to anything. Doesn't matter whether you did it, whether you think you did it or don't. Doesn't matter. Confess to anything. Appease an angry God so that he'll get you back on his favorite list and you can start getting the stuff again. Get your stuff back. The minute Job adopts a mentality of get your stuff back, God loses. So that's kind of what's at stake. Now, of course, throughout Job's friends' discussions, uh, he resists. They're always talking about getting your stuff back. He never talks about getting his stuff back. He always talks about how he is righteous. And finally, when we get to chapter 27, verses 1 through 6, at the end of the dialogue with the friends, This concludes this section. Job says, As surely as God lives, who has denied me justice, the Almighty, who has made my life bitter. He's got some harsh things to say about God. As long as I have life within me and breath of God in my nostrils, my lips will not say anything wicked, and my tongue will not utter lies. I will never admit that you are right. Till I die, I will not deny my integrity. Here's where Job has drawn the line in the sand and said, this is not going to happen. I'm not going to pursue stuff. It's my righteousness that counts. That is Job's integrity. Don't think that Job is above reproach 
in everything that he has to say in this book. He questions God's justice and God calls him on it. Job is not perfect in his responses here. And he's not teaching us how to respond to suffering. But he does hold on to the integrity of saying, I am not in pursuit of stuff, of just the benefits. And of course, that was the question. Is Job's righteousness a disinterested righteousness? Yes, it was. And so should ours be. But the book's not done there. Job's case is still on the board. Why am I suffering? How about that part of God's policies? And the book wants to offer us information about that too. You'll notice that when God gets to his conclusions, where God actually speaks, he doesn't defend his justice. Matter of fact, he even says that, you know, the, have you noticed, Job, that the world around you is not just? That is, that even, you know, it rains where nobody lives. Justice is not driving the system here. See, this retribution principle, if you frame the whole world by thinking about retribution principle, you framed it according to the, the elements of justice. God says that's not the way to think about the world. Because he has not built justice into the system. You've probably noticed that gravity is not just. Okay? It's not built into the system. Okay, so you shouldn't think that everything that happens in this world is going to be just. Remember, it's a fallen world. It's a sinful world. If God were going to maintain a just world, none of us would be here to see it. Okay, so in that sense, God has allowed a world that does not run by justice. That does not mean he is not just. It means he has limited the extent to which he has imposed justice on the world. That means we cannot look at our experiences to assess whether God is doing justice for us or not. Justice isn't ruling in this world, though God himself is just. So what are we supposed to do? You know, you can never assess justice unless you have all the information. If you were witness in a trial or something on a jury, if you didn't have all the information, you couldn't assure that justice was being done. Justice requires all the information. When we talk about God working with us, do we have all the information? No. Can we? No. We don't have all the information. God says instead, the issue is not trying to discern how his justice is being worked out in the world. It's rather that we should look for his wisdom. The focus of the book of Job is on God's wisdom and that we need to trust his wisdom. There is disorder in the world, and it happens to us. And so the world is not just, it's fallen. We cannot do better than God. Lots of times when we're concerned about ourselves or loved ones, we say, boy, you know, you're making a mess of things, God. You know, we could do a better job than this. No. There's your first mistake. You have underrated God and overrated yourself. We cannot do a better job than God does. We trust his wisdom because his wisdom is the foundation. He has created the world he has created to run the way that he has decided to run it. And we must trust his wisdom. We cannot expect explanations. And uh, Jesus deals with this in the book of John. Remember the blind man, the man born blind, John chapter 9. The disciples encounter this man, they all know him, born blind. And they say, who sinned this man or his parents? That he was born blind. This, of course, is a retribution principle question. Got Jesus now. <laughs> Jesus said it was neither this man's sin nor his parents, but that the work of God might be demonstrated in him. Is Jesus saying then, yeah, me and God the Father got together and decided to make this guy blind so that I could heal him right now? No. He's not talking about cause. He is talking about purpose. He is not giving a reason. He is talking about what can be accomplished through it. And that too gives us a way to think about our suffering and the suffering in the world. We should never expect to be able to identify cause, but we can think about purpose. 
We don't ask why, we ask what for. And we may not even feel like we can identify purpose, but we can be certain that God in his wisdom has purposes to accomplish. So we don't expect explanations, but we have to learn to trust God and the wisdom that he has given. And that's where the book of Job brings us. In closing, then, I want to read Romans chapter 11, the great benediction there, because now hopefully you'll be able to see it in a somewhat different light. Oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. Wisdom and knowledge, the depths of it. How unsearchable his judgments, his doing justice, that's unsearchable. And his paths beyond tracing out, you can't figure out everything that he's doing. God is not containable that way. Who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor? We can't advise him on how he ought to work in this world. Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? This is not a great symbiosis. Our righteousness should be disinterested. For from him and through him and for him are all things, including our suffering. And to him be the glory forever. Amen.